Welcome everyone to our summer 2022 speaker series. I'm Gloria Kondrup, the executive director of the Hoffman's Milken Center for Typography. This series is presented by HMCT in collaboration with Art Center's graphic design department and highlights the work of four Art Center alumni. Our final speaker in the series is Oliver Lowe. Originally from the Philippines, Oliver received a master's degree in education and spent several years as a public elementary school teacher. He then attended Art Center and is currently the design director at Turner Duckworth. Some of his collaborations include McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Molson Coors, United Healthcare, and the Brotherhood Sister Soul. Oliver, we are very excited to have you here today and thank you for joining us. Everyone, please welcome Oliver Lowe. All right, I'm gonna just quickly um, introduce myself so that you guys know um, the person behind the voice that's talking. Um, so if I were to basically sum up my life in three pictures, um, these would be the three pictures and they're in chronological order from left to right. So um, before Dan twisted my arm and convinced me to go into graphic design, <laughs> I was um, a first grade teacher for several years. Um, so I um, was in education. Um, I taught in LA from, from um, originally from SoCal and I've since moved here to foggy and cold Bay Area. Um, and in the middle here, you can see um, one of the very first or uh, early classes I took at Art Center at night. Um, and that, like when I took um, Dan's intro to design and then later on intro to packaging class, like I just felt like the design bug kind of bit me. Um, and it um, kind of inspired me to leave teaching and go into design. Um, fast forward to today, I um, am a senior lead designer here at Turner Duckworth. I've been with the company for almost 10 years. Um, and uh, when I'm not working on design, I am obsessing over my plants and my garden. Um, this year, I uh, my garden was featured in the California Native Garden Tour here in the Bay Area. So um, that's just a little bit about myself. Um, now I want to talk about um, where I work. So um, I don't know um, if many of you have heard about Turner Duckworth, but we are a branding agency and we work with um, a lot of brands that you would know. Um, I think part of what makes my work really exciting is I get to work on brands that everyone encounters like every day, multiple times a day, whether you're at home, you're out and about, you're in your car, you're you know shopping at the grocery store, um, you come in contact with a lot of our work um, every single day. Um, we currently have three offices. Um, I work, um, as I said, out of the one in San Francisco, um, but we also have two other studios, one in London and a new one um, that opened up just a few years ago in New York. And even though we have three separate offices, we really see ourselves as one big studio. There's a really um, kind of deep culture um, of collaborating with each other's, uh, uh, with each other and not just um, across studios, but within our studios, you know, we're always working in teams um, and no one here has a big ego. Everyone here pitches in. Um, we're all about, you know, getting that best idea, that winning design um, forward. Um, and across the studios, we um, oftentimes will share work um, across the studios. Um, we often um, uh, share work because it's really important to have objective perspective, you know, when you're in, in, in the work, you can become very hyper-focused and just kind of stuck in your perspective and to have outside people have fresh eyes look at your work is really important. Um, so we work really hard, but we also play really hard, we have lots of fun. Um, that has um, been scaled back a little bit because of COVID, but we're starting to get back into it. In fact, this Friday, we have our summer um, cheers. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and I just wanted to address, um, like right off the bat, kind of this misconception that Turner Duckworth is a packaging agency. And although we have roots in packaging early on, we did a lot of packaging work. We've seen since grown um, to working with brands in particular, we see ourselves as brand partners. Um, and what do we mean by that? We mean that we not just 
um, help brands solve visual problems, but we really look at strategy. We think about how to take their brands to the next level um, and um, uh, how we can help them fulfill um, their, their potential as a brand. Um, and the reason probably why uh, people think of this as a packaging agency is probably because of this. Um, our work with Coca-Cola years and years ago um, sort of put Turner Duckworth on the map. But as you can see, our work goes beyond just packaging. Um, we really are about um, branding and the, the whole visual identity system. Every single touch point, every single experience of the brand we've touched, whether it's you know, physical face, um, uh, digital, social, um, you know, uh, TV advertisements, um, you name it, we've done it. And this is not only limited to soft drinks, but, you know, food, um, finance, whoops, the slide is in the wrong place. I'm, I'll get back to the slide. Um, we work with um, finance, um, we have worked with healthcare brands, um, we also do a lot of tech stuff. Um, you know, every time that you see a new Samsung product launch and you see the visuals for it, the billboards ads, we've touched it in some way or another. Um, and we've even had, um, we've even done a lot of um, work with nonprofits and social justice um, organizations. Um, and I'm going to show a video. So hopefully um, that gives you um, a good idea of sort of the breadth of work that we do. Um, I was about to say that before the video cut me off. Um, but you know, if you are you know having doubts about design or branding, hopefully this kind of inspires you um, at the type of stuff you, you, that you get to do. You know, branding isn't just about a logo, right? Um, we encompass basically every expression of the brand, whether it's motion, it's digital, um, it's physical, it's print. Um, we have the ability to create and be creative. Um, so hopefully that um, inspires you um, to kind of keep pursuing branding if that's something that you're really interested in. Um, I did want to go back to this slide that was sort of out of place um, when I was introducing um, our agency, I'm talking about like our three different studios. One of the fun things that we have as part of our culture is these things that we call office swaps, where we literally spend a month basically in the shoes of a member designer in one of our other sister studios. So I've done a swap where I literally exchanged places with a, a designer in our London studio, and I got to work and live in London. And it's a great experience because one, um, you know, anytime you can uh, step outside of your bubble and experience other cultures, experience 
are experience just new experiences it can um kind of feed into your creativity and inspire you but also seeing how other people um work um around the world and kind of um absorbing um how they work and their creative process is also a really great learning experience so just a little plug for if you do work for us you get to do well so i'm going to go back to um the flow here so our chat today is pretty straightforward. Um, I thought when I was thinking about like, oh, what do I want to talk about with everyone today? I thought, you know, people think of us as a packaging agency. When we get portfolios, a lot of work um, oftentimes is very packaging focused. And I thought it would be kind of funny to kind of turn it on its head and, uh, and talk about packaging, but through the, the lens of branding. Um, and then, you know, you probably get sick of, you know, hearing me talk at some point. So I thought, you know, I, I could just share some really cool work um, from our studio. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some um, Q&A time at the very end. Um, so let's start here. Um, what's the difference between packaging and branding? And at Turner Duckworth, we really see packaging as branding. And what do we mean by that? Um, when you look at the, the, these two images on the left and the right, um, on the left side you have cola and on the right side you have cola, these products are essentially the same, right? It's carbonated sugar water. <laughs> um, so how do we tell these things apart? Well, we can put some packaging on it um, and they start to feel like different things, but when do they become different things? Uh, it's when we, start to brand them. And that's what branding is all about. Um, so when we talk about packaging to us, it's just one form of branding. It's one expression of a brand. It's one way that the consumer um, experiences and interacts with a brand. Um, and there are many other um, consumer experiences. Um, we call them touch points, whether it's you know print, um, TV commercial, social, um, uniforms, swag, um, retail stores, all of these are part of branding. And um, so when we are designing packaging, we have to keep in mind that packaging um, is part of a, a bigger brand system. So it's never, um, it never exists on its own in a vacuum. It needs to live within a brand system, right? Um, and that's how we build an unmistakable brand. Anytime a consumer touches a part of our brand, whether it's, you know, um, online or in a physical space or when you're driving by the highway, those experiences need to feel connected, need to feel like the brand, regardless of how, which touch point, which media you're experiencing it through. Um, another great example of um, an unmistakable brand is Nike. Um, and the reason why it's unmistakable is that it's so flexible that and every time it shows up, it shows up in a different way. Um, so it's um, constantly changing, um, which makes it really interesting and engaging. But regardless of how it shows up, it's always really unmistakable that it's Nike. And it's not just about having a logo, right? It's all about their um, brand behavior, how they behave as a brand, how they show up. So unmistakable branding requires, um, you know, physical, tangible things that are consistent, like a logo or like a color palette or a symbol. But it also requires um, some untangible um, things as well. Um, things like tone of voice, things like brand behavior. Um, and all those things should ladder up to um, a central brand idea. So we recently redesigned the Sprite packaging. They are moving from the green plastic bottles to um, a clear one. Um, clear uh, plastic bottles are easier to recycle. So, um, but they kind of wanted to center their new um, brand idea around um, clarity, around the idea of having clarity of self-expression. So it's a play on the word of clarity, right? It's clear liquid, clear container, um, but also being clear about who you are. 
So um, with that in mind, we um, designed a visual identity, identity system, not just branding, um, that really conveyed that idea of clarity um, and clarity of self-expression. And so even though our brand shows up in different ways, in different forms, whether it's packaging or social media or on a website, everything hangs together because we have that central brand idea. So the first point is that packaging is branding. Um, and I kind of hinted at this um, at the end of this first section, um, and that's the second point being that um, great packaging often begins with a big idea. So, you know, we often hear we can't judge a book by its cover. And we actually do that all the time. When we walk to a bookstore and we're trying to pick out a book, the first thing that we look at is like the book cover, like the title, the pictures on it. We read the bio on the back. And although the, the book cover doesn't tell us everything that's inside the book, right? Because, you know, they're trying to get you to read the book. Um, it does say a lot, right? You can tell what's nonfiction versus the self-help versus fantasy, sci-fi. You can tell a lot by the cover. And that's the same with packaging. Um, so I put just four examples here. Um, so it's going from the left to right, the overly packaging. Um, it looks really simple. But when we look at like, you know, it's got... Um, you know, this sort of um, hand-drawn um, and imperfect um, style of illustration and, and typography. It's not a speech bubble. Um, it feels very human. Um, and so I can tell from this brand that um, it's nutritious for me, it's good for me, it's good for the environment, um, and it's natural. Um, when we look at the San Pellegrino um, packaging, um, the fact that it's got, you know, a foil seal and it's got sort of the pattern that, you know, you, you always associate with like money or like really official certificate. And the fact that like there's words in there that are in Italian, it really speaks to that fine creamy Italian taste. Um, on the opposite end of the spe spectrum, you have like the very iconic Amazon box um, and you know the central idea there is very clear right it's literally a smile delivered to your door and you know there's a really conscious decision about the corrugated cardboard here right because they're trying to say that we are you know not wasting money on on beautiful packaging because we want to save you money we want to put your your savings your your um experience first um, rather than you know spending money making our box beautiful. Um, and then um, as a counterpoint to that, you know, when we look at like an Apple iPhone box, it's like the total opposite, right? It's beautifully crafted. You know, I still have boxes from my old iPhones that I haven't thrown away. Like I have no use for it, but it just feels so premium and precious. And, you know, you can get a sense about what this brand is about just by opening the packaging. Um, you know, really everything fits, you know, perfectly. And it's all about, you know, innovation and engineering. So as designers, we, um, and, you know, I'm guilty of this, like when I, you know, when I was a student of like, we really want to rush to the execution because we want to start, you know, filling the blank page, right? Um, but it's really important to make sure that we start off with, you know, the central idea, the brand idea, right? Because all your design decisions, you know, what typeface you use, what color you use, all of those things should ladder up to that brand idea. And that's what holds the system together. So as an exercise, I have some examples to see if we can kind of guess at what the big idea is um, behind these packaging. So this is really simple, right? There's not, there's basically two elements here, a Coke bottle and flip-flops. So what is the big idea behind this? Um, anyone want to take a guess? Summer. Yeah, 100%, right? Like, it's so simple, and it just basically says that cook tastes great with summer. Um, this one's a little bit trickier. Um, what's the big idea here? 
craft. Craft, yeah, exactly, right? Like the fact that when you look at the wax seal, every seal is unique. It's every seal is individually hand dipped. Um, when you look at the edges of the paper, it looks hand torn. There's like handwritten notes in there. And what they're trying to say is that each one of these bottles is uniquely and, um, you know, made with care, right? Distilled with care. And each bottle of bourbon that takes years um, for it to um, become bourbon. So um, the idea here is, you know, um, the feeling of um, that this is made with hands, made by hands. Um, this one is um, one of our designs, Ponte of Paris. Um, and the idea here is inspiration, right? Um, so Conte de Paris um, was um, a brand that was started by um, a French artist who invented the um, graphite pencil. And so, you know, when we think about artists and how they get inspiration, artists get inspiration from seeing the world around them. So what better way to tie the idea of inspiration and Paris together by putting you know, um, beautiful images, um, or, uh, beautiful images of iconic places in Paris um, on the packaging. Um, and then lastly, um, we designed this um, packaging for Metallica for um, their album that was entitled Hardwire to Self-Destruct. And um, the central idea here being self-destruction. Um, the band leader, the band member, um, he wrote a um, song talking about um, PTSD and um, and uh, drug addiction uh, and uh, drug dependency. And um, it's all about how um, we're constantly like fighting um, our nature, um, or fighting our dark side. And so the um, art director of this photo shoot and we caught um, all of the um, pictures of the band members together and it kind of formed a sort of grotesque um, like creature that really speaks to the idea of like you know sort of like all the voices that you hear um, and then we also like took like the MRI um, images of a brain and we saw how it almost looked like an explosion and it really um, kind of gets at that idea of self-destruction. So packaging is branding, um, and packaging should start out with a big idea. Um, but packaging also has to play a very functional role. And when we um, look at packaging through the lens of branding, we need to think about wayfinding, because at the end of the day, we want people to buy the products that's inside the packaging. So we need to think about standing out, right? There's a reason why Tide Detergent all of their bottles are orange. And that logo is essentially a bullseye. Like it's really hard to miss when you're walking um, through the store. Um, and not only do we need to stand out, but we need to stand apart. And I've already shown this example earlier between Coke and Pepsi, right? They're essentially the same product, um, but they need to look different. Um, they need to kind of differentiate from each other. Um, and within the brand, we also need to differentiate between products. Um, so, um, you know, it's really clear which of these um, is food for cats and which of these is food for dogs. And then even um, a step further, um, that there's different, you know, flavors um, or different ingredients. So using color to cue that. Um, we also use packaging um, to help uh, show what's inside, right? So when I'm shopping, or chips, I know what I'm gonna get. Um, so here we're using visual wit, not just to indicate flavor, but we're playing um, off of the shape of a tortilla chip. So even if you don't read any of the words, you get a sense like, oh, these are not potato chips, these are tortilla chips. Um, we can also use um, uh, packaging to um, indicate product benefits. So you know, here um, we made the labels look like as if they're, you know, not sticking or that they're slipping off um, the products to really get at, you know, um, the benefit that you're getting um, when you buy this product. And then lastly, um, you know, 
packaging should um, create appeal, right? Like you want people to buy it, which um, leads us to our last point. Um, so we talked about packaging as branding. We talked about packaging, having starting with a big idea and packaging as wayfinding to aid um, people when they're shopping. Um, but it needs to go beyond that, right? It can't just be purely functional. You have to create an emotional connection because at the end of the day, um, where we started, um, we talked about how packaging is how a brand expresses itself, how um, people experience the brand. So at the end of the day, packaging needs to be able to connect people to the brand. So how do we do that? There's so many different ways, and I'm just going to list a few here. One is we can do it through language and tone of voice, right? We can sound very professional and trustworthy, or we can come off as very friendly and approachable. We can use humor. Um, so, um, you know, as graphic designers, we often really focus on visuals, but we forget the power of words. Um, Packaging also can create an emotional um, connection through um, um, impressions, right? Like the way that um, someone opens a packaging, that opening ceremony can create a lot of drama and create an experience um, that is really memorable for the consumer. Packaging can uh, make you look and look again, right? You can create these memorable kind of aha moments um, by playing with visual wit. It can invite discovery and interaction. Um, we can encourage people to spend more time with our packaging. So um, this is uh, a project I got to work on. We are designing a um, Metallica album and the idea was through the number. So we used the M in their logo to create this kind of do not symbol. Um, and we actually um, printed and die cut um, actual stencils that people could use to stencil the symbol um, on, on things. So it's really inviting participation. Um, and then inviting discovery. Um, I kind of mentioned visual wit, but like we also hid all these like really subtle details in the packaging everywhere that were sort of like Easter eggs, right? That only true Metallica fans would like have any clue about. And um, there's something that's really special when someone feels like they're in the know. So on the top right there, you see like it looks like just like um, the shape of like when you peel a tape off, that's like the leftover shape. And it's in the shape of a coffin, which um, alludes to one of their other albums, um, Death and Net. Um, packaging can create an, an emotional connection um, through shareworthy moments, right? make it something that people want to share. It's free publicity. Um, and then lastly, make something people will want to throw away. So really thinking about like, are there ways that you can extend the life of packaging um, beyond the shelf? Um, and these are just a few ways to create um, that emotional connection. It's not everything, um, but just some things for you to think about when you're designing. So um, to summarize, packaging is branding, right? It doesn't exist in isolation. It, it belongs to a big system. Um, and the system is held together by, um, you know, tangible visual elements like logo, color, and typography. But um, more than that, it's tied together with a big central idea. Um, so making sure that we start off with an idea um, that all of our design decisions and all of our executions ladder up to. Packaging needs to be functional, right? Beyond just, you know, containing um, the product, protecting the product, allowing it to be easily shipped, which as graphic designers, we often don't have control of. That's often like the, the sphere of, um, you know, packaging engineers. Um, we do have a really important role because packaging um, determines um, how people shop for your product. Um, so making sure that our product is um, providing that wayfinding. Um, and then lastly, because packaging is one expression of the brand, it's how the consumer experiences the brand, making sure that we are building um, ways to connect with um, consumers. So I've talked a lot. I'm just gonna show some cool work now. Um, so the first, um, I have three case studies here and hopefully I'll get through 
um, all of them, but it's not we can um, skip some of them. But uh, the first case study here I want to share with you is Dollar Tree Club. Um, so um, quickly, the design problem we're trying to solve is, first of all, um, they had a new ambition, right? When they first started, it was direct to consumer. You order online, it's a subscription-based thing, they send you a user. So, you know, their packaging was designed for shipping, but they were wanted to break into the retail market. And, you know, when you think about shipping a product versus it needing to um, live on a shelf, those are very, two different very different um, needs. So really you need to kind of think about how would their products show up on shop against other products. Um, secondly, they were moving from one product to many. So, you know, their logo, their name was all about shaving, um, but they were doing so much more than that. So we really need to sort of evolve their branding to address that. And then lastly, they need to stand out from the competition because this mark, this category is just saturated with um, with options to making sure that our brand feels distinctly different. Um, so the first thing we, that we did was we addressed the baggage that came with their name. So dollar shape club and, you know, intrinsically it's problematic, right? Because dollar can kind of have that connotation with something that's cheap. Shave feels limiting because they're moving beyond that. Um, and club could potentially mean that they're exclusive. And we wanted to sort of turn that word club on its head and talk about club being sort of a community of um, people um, supporting each other. So we moved away from that razor symbol, um, again, because we're trying to open up their brand to represent more than just shaving. Um, and we created this monogram um, DSC to sort of take attention and emphasis away from our name and give them a mark that is easily recognizable. And in the future, they could potentially um, walk away from the dollar shape club altogether, kind of like IBM. But in the meantime, it's locked up so that you know new consumers are uh, know about what DSC stands for and sort of like educating them about our brand. Um, and then I talked about how, you know, they um, needed to show up on shelf and they need to be clear that they're from one brand. And before they intentionally made the decision to make each packaging and each product really distinct. So it felt like they were curating a collection of different products for you. But on shelf, they really need to feel like, oh, we are one brand and this is coming to you from Dollar Shave Club. So there was a very deliberate decision to um, apply a very monolithic approach in terms of color, in terms of the way we apply our branding. <clears throat> um, but monolithic doesn't mean everything's the same. We need to make sure that we help with wayfinding and people can distinguish between products on shelf. So we help simplify their product um, and make sure there's a clear communication hierarchy so that you know, you know the brand first what this product is. And then if you wanted to know a little bit more, we can read the fine, uh, fine um, copy about you know, um, benefits or descriptions from quantity and all of that. And we also um, added some kind of wayfinding tools like iconography and color, again, to help with wayfinding. Um, and like I said, packaging doesn't um, exist on its own, right? So we, to, we went beyond packaging and thought about like photography and how we show up um, outside of packaging. So we help art direct um, their photography style. Um, and then we create a, a visual identi identity system that was very typographically based because they had a brilliant um, team of copywriters and we wanted their tone of voice to really shine. So um, giving them the tools to do that. Again, embracing their that sort of wit and tone of voice here, um, and um, along with you know uh, lifestyle imagery, we also help direct you know ingredient stories, um, imagery that told ingredient stories, and with the central idea here again of like you know like um, the idea of like being part of a club and being a member of a community. So we wanted these images to feel really artful, like they could live in like a wellness club or a spa. Some other cool um, uh, billboards and out of home executions. 
Um, and then this just reinforced the idea that, you know, branding or uh, packaging um, is just one expression of a brand. Um, and it needs to kind of live within the world of um, a brand identity system. And um, the central idea here being your best friend in the bathroom. So it's really straightforward. The tone of voice really comes through here, like um, the way that you would talk to your bro or your friend. So that's Dollar Shape Club. Um, moving on quickly to Four Nudos. Um, so this is what Four Nudos looked like before. Um, and um, to start out, the design problem that we we're trying to solve, um, very similarly to Dollar Shave Club, is you needed to help them stand out, right? Tequila, the tequila category is very um, crowded. There's a lot of competition, and they're practically the same, it's the same liquid inside, right? Um, so not only did we need to help them stand out, but we also need to help them stand apart. They look like another brand. So we need to make sure that they had a distinct point of view. Um, and then at the time that they came to us, um, the perception around tequila was changing. You know, it's going from like the sort of drink just to get you drunk or like, you know, spring break and really bad, you know, drinks and hangovers to something that you actually um, make cocktails with and, and sip to enjoy. So how can we make the brand feel um, a little less like tequila tequila and more premium? Um, and we started out, out with um, what they had. So on their packaging, there it was embossed in the bottle and um, on the label that the agave um, icon. But then when we took a look at the competition, it just did not feel very distinct, right? Every tequila brand has it in some form or another. Um, so, but what we thought was distinct was their label shape. It has this kind of leaf shape and we it kind of reminded us of an agave leaf. So we thought about like, how can we push the idea further um, to communicate, to tell that ingredient story. So um, this is the design um, and it's currently in market right now. And you can see how that label really stands out um, even in a dark bar. Um, and we provided some supporting elements like different colored neck labels to help distinguish um, between different um, products and different ages of tequila. Um, and not only that, but we created this um, real, uh, this, this symbol called the tree wonder that feels really handcrafted um, to tell the story about um, the innovation of making tequila. Um, and when we um, design for packaging, um, we often have to think, think in um, 360 design. So not just the front, but what do the sides, what do the tops, what do the backs look like? Um, and so making sure that we have all the tools to do for our um, brand to show up in all these really interesting ways. And not just from um, in packaging, but also in print. on billboard, TV commercials, um, and then even in physical spaces, it all feels like the same brand. And yes, it has a lot to do with um, color palette. It has a lot to do with photography and typography, all those tangible elements, but it's also about you know having that central idea. Um, in this case, the idea was um, the spirit of independence um, and making sure that that came through in all of our executions, being really bold um, um, in all of our design decisions. Um, so I had one more case study, but we are at the end of time, right, um, Alex? Yes, we will open the... Yeah, so we'll open it up for questions. Q &A. Hey, Oliver. So that is amazing, of course. I mean, not surprising at all. <clears throat> so my question to you, at one point you said, um, you know, branding isn't just about, you know, the logo and what, what's, what was your experience going from, from school and working with these really large corporate clients? Like what, what's different than you expected? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think the luxury of school is that um, your projects are sort of 
in they're, they're hypothetical projects so they're not you don't have the same constraints as you do in the real world and it's really great because you can really kind of push um, your creativity but I think um, one thing um, I learned very quickly um, once I start work working was um, you know oftentimes there are a lot of um, like the client will come to you with a lot of limitation right like if you know you're working for McDonald's, you can't just like just grab the golden arches and be like, no, oh, you're just not gonna be the golden arches anymore, <laughs> right? Um, um, so but that sort of constraint or that sort of limitation actually becomes um inspiration for creativity. Having to work in that sort of narrow box often forces you to um come up with really creative solutions and um, and so it's really important um, as designers, not just to answer what the client's brief, but to always have an eye for sort of the potential, like what, like here, let's check the box of what the client has asked for, but let's show them, you know, what else we can do and what more we can do. Um, so like a, a good example that I like to, to, to talk about is um, when McDonald's came to us um, and they were just releasing Uber Eats and they wanted to release some like limited edition swag to sort of promote the program. And they're like, here are, the, here are some shirts and some things that you can, you know, put our, our logo on. And so we're like, okay, well, here's what that would look like, like really boring. Um, but then we also like, came up with this whole collection, like a hoodie that looked like a, fr a fry packaging, um, like a set of limited edition playing cards, some slippers that look like sesame seed buns. And, you know, one, the client was super excited and ended up, you know, like doing like a collection of like, I don't know how many items, like 30 items when they only asked for five. But um, these, um, items like went viral, like people were selling them and pawning them off on eBay for like hundreds of dollars. And it just shows you like the power of um, design and how design can create that brand love or that brand appeal and how, um, you know, even in the real world, when the constraints, uh, the design constraints are there, it's really important to look beyond the brief and really think about the creative potential behind what the client's asking for. Also cool. so, Dan, anything oh. you want to say before we turn the chats to students? Uh, outstanding job, Oliver. Uh, just fantastic. So insightful. Uh, and uh, we thank you so much for bringing that to us. I think we have a, a grad student who's got a question. Carson, if you want to unmute and maybe ask Oliver directly. Hi, Oliver. Thank you so much for speaking with us. This was such an amazing presentation. Um, my question for you is a bit about the design process. Do you find yourself with a big brand like Dollar Shave Club or Hornitos throwing crazy ideas at the wall, like a purple tequila bottle or sort of, I'm curious what a little peek into your process is like. Um, the On the client side or on our side, like the designers? On your side. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Bennett, did you want to talk? So yeah. um, I have my colleague Bennett and Daphne here with me. Daphne is actually an art center alum, but I um, asked them to join me for the Q&A because I thought it'd be great to hear from some younger designers who um, just been starting out. So Bennett. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really good question. Um, a lot of the time I think, oh, and by the way, my name is Bennett. Uh, I'm a junior designer at TD, um, but yeah, a lot of the time, I think on these bigger, you know, client pitches, we obviously need to provide something that's a little bit like, you know, closer to home safer, because, you know, if we just presented stuff that was completely against kind of everything that their brand stood for, they probably would be a little bit frustrated, but um, I would say it's a mix. I think a lot of the time we'll present a concept that is an adaptation of what they currently have and you know made better um to kind of you know our standard and then we'll also do options where it is a bit of a you know like a little bit far farther off than what they've done and i think hornitos is a good example of that um we can't really share i think some of the concepts there but um you know there were a lot of other different concepts that we presented to them and um they some of them were in a lot 
a lot more different. And, you know, the one that they picked is relatively similar to what they used to have, but it, you know, it is an adaptation. So I think, um, yeah, it, it's a mix of both. But. And if I can build on that, it really goes back to um, what I was saying before, why it's really important to know what the brand is about and what the idea is behind that brand. Because yeah, sure, like I don't want to ever say like, don't throw pur purple tequila, you know, bottle like into the mix, but why, you know, like when you look at the history of Pernitas and, you know, green is associated with them and it's associated with the agave, you know, plants, like why would you introduce a purple bottle? So really thinking about the why behind what you're doing is very important. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Nice. Next, we have a question from Sean N. What was the hardest design challenge that you had to overcome in a particular project? That's a hard one. Yeah. Definitely the hard one. Um, I need to think. Okay. Um, give us a minute to think about that one. Is there another question we can tackle in the time, in the time uh, for the time being? Yeah, I had a question. Hi, Oliver. Uh, my name is Jillian Stiles. I'm a grad graphic design student. Um, I was just interested, since you come from such a different background with education, and now that you've spent a handful of years on the team, uh, have you noticed any other skill sets kind of outside of the context of design that really bring value to, I don't know, level up or engage in like copywriting or um, particular leadership skills or, or anything of that sort that maybe kind of your different background can highlight? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I kind of hinted at this earlier too, like it's really important for us that work in design to constantly be inspired. Um, and the way that we get inspired is to kind of step outside of our bubble our every day. So, you know, if you have a hobby, like if you have other interests that really feeds into your creativity, um, and definitely, like with design, it's a very multidisciplinary um, area. So when I feel like, you know, when I was a teacher, um, I had to communicate a lot with um, my students who were six years old. So, and I feel like when I present work to clients, I often put on my teacher's hat because clients are not designers. So you have to be able to talk about your work in a way that they can understand, right? You need to half of the battle is designing something good and the other half is being able to tell the story of why your design is better than what they currently have. And so I think teaching has given me the skills to be able to talk about the work in a very persuasive um, way and taking the client along on the journey. Um, so I mean, that's just like one example from my personal experience of why I feel like um, like a different discipline can really enhance. Um, you mentioned copywriting, that's huge. I, I'm not a great copywriter, um, but you know, we have people on the team that like they can put words on the page and it's just very like compelling. So yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I've read some of your copy you've written, Oliver, and it's pretty dang good. So <laughs> I think it's <I'm> humble. <laughs> oh yeah, from the poison apple, that was good. Yeah. Awesome. Next, we have a question from Hina Kang. I think as a senior lead designer, do you have your hands on the entire design process, including research, for instance? Um, yes. Um, and research is very important. I, should be, I feel like Art Center teaches that really well. Um, because like I said, like um, you can't design, you can't offer a solution without really understanding what the brand is about. And Research, you know, can take many forms, right? Like it can be internet searching. Um, when I worked on a co um, packaging pro project, I had the um, really special opportunity to go to their um, headquarters in Atlanta and go into their archive room where they had like, like, like historic like artifacts and stuff. Um, but even like, you know, um, what I didn't get to um, at the very end is um, the importance of. Um, like going to the store, um, going to the places where your packaging or your product or your brand lives, um, you know, it's really important to, to know where you're showing up so you, you can make this design decisions based on that, informed design decisions based on that. So 
you know, oftentimes when we do packaging, we'll do shelf sets, we'll go to the store, take pictures, and then we'll su superimpose um, our products in there to make sure that, you know, we're addressing all the things I talked about, like creating stands out, um, standing apart from competitors, like easy wayfinding, um, all of those things. So um, yes, I, I do get involved in the design process from beginning to end. Sorry, I got on a tangent. Um, from research, um, um, I do a little bit of art direction. Um, I do a little bit of designing. I do a lot of presenting to clients. And then I also help with production. So when a design has been signed off, I help prepare our files to hand off to our production team who you know, creates all the files that are needed for printing or releasing to the clients for their use on digital or print or whatever. So, yeah. Oh, super cool. Do you ever feel overwhelmed or is it very more of a linear and systematic process? Um, it comes and goes, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are days when it's very focused on one task and one project, and then there are days where we're um, balancing a lot of different things. Um, and those days can get stressful, but it's also I mean, the, the reason why I like um, being a more sort of senior designer is that I can kind of bounce between different projects and that keeps things interesting. Mm. So, and how was that compared to your time at our center as a student? Um, it's very comparable. Um, not as many um, all-nighters. Um, I think we're less <laughs> balanced, it's really important. Don't want to burn out, but I think, um, and Daphne, I should let you speak on this, but like, I feel like um, you should treat school like it's your job, basically, because the habits that you form at school are going to be the habits that take that you take with you to your job. So if you're not turning assignments on time, if you're not showing up to class, like those things, like you know, um, if you're not like. Um, working well with your colleagues um, or your teachers like I mean it's a reflection of how you're going to be once you work with a boss or your client so um, develop like treat your class as if it was your work um, because you, you don't know right like you know you might be looking for a job and a person that's on the other side is someone that you were in class with and they're like I don't know how you even show your class you know like you never know um, so um, yeah Thank you. Next, we have a question from Brian L. Are you able to share the type of revenue revenue impact for brands that invest in an identity rehaul? Um, can you clarify the question? Is it like how much it costs for brands to do that? Oh no, I was just wondering if like a because I know it costs oh. a considerable amount for a mm -hmm. brand to do that. I'm just wondering like how much Hornito sees like a spike in their social traffic or just engagement. Yes. Um, I wish I had numbers to show you. We have slides for that um, in, in other presentations, but um, yes, a hundred percent. I mean, that's the only reason why brands do redesigns, right? Um, and um, we have numbers for like McDonald's. We have numbers for like when we redesign Burger King. Like, oh yeah, yeah. you want to share that then? Yeah, so um, for the Miller Lite rebrand that we did a little while ago, um, it said profit increased by over 30 million and volume grew for the first time in seven years. So yeah, sometimes we do share that stuff on like case studies as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Like I think like when we um launched like the McDonald's My Rewards, like mm -hmm. I forget like the num like the record breaking numbers of people that like downloaded and installed the apps on their phones. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, for sure. Like, and we like to keep track of those revenues because it um, allows us to like pitch work um, to new clients. Next, we have a question from Lillian Pham. Has sustainability influence how you design packaging? Cool. Daphne, do you have a question? Do you have an answer to like the, the most difficult experience you've had? Um, sure, I can answer. Okay, we'll answer that first question and we'll come back to the sustainability. Awesome. I would say it kind of like what Oliver already say. Um, I think it's about connecting your story with the brand, um, especially when you're pitching your ideas. It's important to make sure like whatever design or ideas you have has a connection to the brand. Um, no matter like how 
if you even if you find like a cool graphic, if it's just cool, it's not going to sell. So it's important to be able to tell a good story. That that will be probably like the most challenging thing for me for design. Cool, thanks, Daphne. Um, going back to the question about um sustainability, um. We um, work with big brands, and so we're very conscious of the fact that we have a very large impact on the world. And so whenever we can, we do um, include um, uh, considerations about sustainability. Again, as long as it fits within the brand story. Um, so um, like, you know, an example of that is like we recently um, did some um, like, uh, uh, I think it's whiskey um, packaging, and we we came up with some like ideas for some whiskey packaging using like alternative um, um, biodegradable like materials. Um, so um, we do, you know, we it, it doesn't always get sold through because sustainable um, packaging oftentimes comes with a cost, and sometimes uh, companies aren't willing to to do that, but um but we always um have a mind on that um as long as again it's right for the brand and it makes sense for them um like a good example is like mcdonald's like just recently um redesigned their mcflurry packaging so that it kind of gets rid so it gets rid of the plastic top um to them and that has a really huge impact right if you think about how many mcflurries they sell a day so um definitely it's a consideration Awesome. And we'll squeeze one last question in. I think this one's quite interesting for the students that are looking for internships. What kind of things do you look for in a potential intern slash employee portfolios? And this one's by Liana Le Veers. Hi, Liana. How about we each take one? Okay. So do you want me to start with? Yeah, start start with I'll start. Um, so potential things that we look um, in portfolios, um, there's a lot that we look for. Um, but I would say my number one thing that I look for is, um, do you understand um, branding um, and sort of systems thinking, like design systems thinking? Um, so we don't want to see um, like a type poster. We don't want to, like, we want to see a type poster because we want to know how you deal with typography, but we don't want to see like isolated projects. We want to see that you understand like an entire system, like, you know, like kind of like the case studies I showed you, like the packaging, like how does the brand and the packaging live beyond the packaging? Like how does it live on print? How does it live um, in social media? How does it like live on like swag? Like um, show us the system, show us that you can go beyond just like, oh, I created a logo and I just Photoshopped it on different things. Like we want to see how you can flex that system and get interesting and engaging um, every time it shows up in a different touch point. Mm -hmm. So that would be my big thing. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. I think a lot of the time when we look at portfolios, we really want to make sure that like when you design a certain aspect of that, you're not just, you know, placing a logo on it, whether that be like swag or, you know, um, certain stuff like that. Because a lot of the time, you know, people will just, you know, throw a nice mock above like the logo on a shirt and like that's cool and it looks good, but it doesn't have any idea behind it. Um, so I think, yeah, just like really you should put a brief behind every part of the project that you're working on. So if you did a visual identity system for, I don't know, like a food company, you know, um, you know, if you're going to do merch, right, think about merch as its own brief. Like how do you want their colors and, you know, like what do you want typography to be a part of it? So just really like treat every asset of, um, you know, each case study as its own brief. Yeah, I, I agree that's really important. And also, I, I also think that um, every decision you make in design, um, there has to be a good reason, like why do you make that decision? Does it connect to the, the concept um, or the brand you're designing for? Um, I think that's pretty important to have. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and like showing process, like, mm -hmm. Um, we get a lot of portfolios that look really polished, but we can't see like the idea behind it or what was the design problem that you're trying to solve behind it. So 
like show us like if you were talking about like oh yeah like we made the packaging more like easier to shop like show us like put it on the shelf set you know um show us your process of how you got there and what, what be, like tell the story of what were the problems that you're trying to solve with design so thank you so much for all the great questions and for your time thank you guys so much it was really great presentation we've learned so much especially myself and i think especially after seeing this presentation really gave me a new appreciation to dan's pack one class really seeing how the things he pointed out in his class being pushed forward more in the real world I think it's really incredible thank you for that alan and all the way through our whole program uh led by gerardo herrera and uh, gerardo's process which sean knows is just an amazing what he teaches the students will prepare them uh, to enter into these great companies like Turner Duckworth. What a, what a fabulous session. Thank you, Sean, Alan, Oliver, Bennett, Daphne, everybody involved. This has been uh, really, really insightful. I hope we, uh, you guys come and work for us someday. <laughs> I'm sure you will have <laughs> there <you> <laughs> We, we, got some really, Hell yeah. <laughs> we have some very talented people uh, here this afternoon. So I think that's going to, you, you'll be hearing from some of them. <laughs> if the students have any more questions or how, how would they reach out to you guys? Um, you can reach out to um, SF internships at turnerduckworth.com. I should have put my own email address here, but it's pretty easy. So it's Oliver, my first name, and then dot. Hello, my last name spelled hello. So Oliver low at turnerduckworth.com. So yeah, like if you have questions that we didn't get to, please send them our way. No Thank problem. you, Oliver. Come down and visit us. Oh yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Gerardo. Thanks, students. Thank you so much.